program by Shabba today. Welcome to the program, which I hope will enrich your knowledge about Bangladesh. Today's program aims to celebrate the success of one of the world's poorest countries. We will hear from people of this country who are trying to help the Bangladeshi people. We hope to discuss different avenues that can be developed in Bangladesh to continue its success. We will hear representatives from different fields, from newspaper writers to students, from MPs to community people, who will share their experiences and ideas on making Bangladesh a better place for its citizens. What about the change in Supreme Court? What is the significance of First of all, of course, study hard. Study hard. Be ambitious. There is a wealth of job in the civil service. A lot of people don't understand um, what the civil service is and what it actually does. It does everything from collecting your taxes and managing your um, sort of uh, social security and welfare and, and all of that to um, diplomacy, becoming an ambassador, or working in the Ministry of Defence. So there is um, absolutely sort of every range of job in the, in the civil service. So it doesn't matter which degree you study, okay? but if you're bright and you want to change something, you believe in something, you want to serve um, the public, you believe in doing some public good, okay? Um, and, and you do well, in school, go on to university, get a, get a good degree, then um, maybe you'll be most welcome. We're looking for talented people from all sections of, of British society. How long do you believe it will take for Bangladesh to progress onto a sustainable level to pull itself out of being underdeveloped NEDC into a more So, you know, there, there are some good, good indications. The economy is, is growing. We know the people are capable. Malaysia, actually, uh, was in the same situation as Bangladesh only about 35 years ago. People were comparing the two countries. South Korea, 30 years ago, was seen to be poorer than, than Bangladesh. And it is this potential that sort of stares you in the face that is perhaps this, in a way, the saddest thing uh, about Bangladesh. And so I sincerely hope that before my life is over, that I can look back to Bangladesh and say, you know, say to some other country, I want to see this country become like Bangladesh because look what's, what has happened to it. And I certainly think it's possible within uh, 15 to 20 years. Will you visit the village in which you were born during your time in Bangladesh? How will you feel about that? being an international ambassador? Um, I, I don't think I'll be allowed not to visit if I get a chance. <laughs> That's all. Yes, of course I will. Um, and, you know, that, that probably as, as soon as I can. I know I, I, I see the demand, I see, I see what people are saying. I, I would love to go there. Um, how would I feel about that? I think it will be a very emotional experience. I'm delighted to have been asked to welcome those of you who have traveled from around the country to be here. In particular, I would like to thank His Excellency, Mr. Anwar Chaudhry, for agreeing to join us. Welcome to Birmingham. <laughs> Before I move on, Mr. Chaudhry, I can tell you that Birmingham is well known for his hospitality, and I think you will enjoy your stay here in Birmingham. And in Birmingham, they normally say that you can, uh, cannot guarantee the weather. One minute is shining, the other minute you might have a, 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 a big pouring down rain. But one thing we can guarantee you that you will have a, 
a warmest of a welcome here in Birmingham, wherever you will go. I'm sure many of you are aware Shaba is re registered charity, which is founded in 2001 to address the difficulties intercounted by British Bangladeshis living in Birmingham. I know that it supported members of Bangladeshi community with the project based around education, recreation, careers development, and, em un em and employment. Shaba is also you now working internationally setting up projects in Bangladesh itself. The emphasis is to provide education through a scholarship scheme. I would, I would in particular like to draw your attention to Shaba campaign for Makliza Akhtar Anna, a 15 years old girl who lives with her mother in uh, Sum Sumnam Jung region in Bangladesh. Makliza was badly burned while preparing a tea for her mother. At the time, she was in the middle of setting her exams. She now requires a long-term support and is unable to work. The health services in Bangladesh are unable to help. Shava is now collecting money for Makliza to help ease her suffering and to show her that the other do care. Please take time to read your brochures this evening. Read about Makliza and how you can help her and other like her in Bangladesh. I know that some of you have already made donation for Makliza and we hope that Mr. Anwar Chaudhary may consent to deliver this donation direct to her. We thank you for that. However, we must move on. We have a very an interesting program this evening with a illustrious list of speakers talking about their different experience and connections with Bangladesh. The evening will conclude with culture program. May I conclude once again thanking you for inviting me here this evening. Now I would like to introduce to you Atiya Amun, who will talk about childhood in Bangladesh. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum. During my lifetime, I have visited Bangladesh three times now. However, while visiting Bangladesh with my family during a holiday in 2002, I began to observe the people there more closely. I saw how Bangladesh was poverty stricken, how the living and working conditions of the average Bangladeshi was not up to the standards of that of the UK or any other more economically developing country or less um, economically developing country. I witnessed how the children there were mainly playing with cardboard boxes in the street. I was also shocked when I saw children having a wa wash and drinking the same water, which was easily contaminated with germs, which can cause diseases. The thing that struck me the most during my visit was how Bangladesh is deeply poverty stricken. I came, for example, I came across a mother and a child in tears begging for money at my feet. I would now like to talk about child labour in Bangladesh. While doing some background reading, it came to my surprise that an estimated 496,000 children are working in slavery. In Dhaka, as many as 300,000 children work at home, having little educational opportunities. It is very sad to see how many children are working, working at home rather than going to school, college, or socializing with friends. This is another factor why the child literacy rate in Bangladesh is so low compared to other less economically developing countries. It has been found that child domestic workers generally have to work for 15 hours a day, seven days a week, without breaks. Reports from human rights monitors indicate that child kidnapping and trafficking for labor bondage continues to be a serious and widespread problem in Bangladesh. It also shocks me to know children at the age of five are working to feed their families too. I was emotionally disturbed when I gave a present, a small piece of jewelry to a domestic worker she broke down into tears in front of me. The amount of emotion she showed towards me will be something that I'll never forget because they, because they barely get anything just for being poor. Another major issue in Bangladesh is hunger. Children get hungry every day due to being brought up in a poverty-stricken area. Day by day, children are restricted to what they can eat, so they just pester the shopkeepers till they get some food. 
I was even more distressed when I saw children begging for food and money. Because of widespread poverty in the homes, many children begin to work at a very young age. Bangladesh government estimates an approximately a whopping 6.6 .6 million children between the ages of 5 and 14 years start to work and can be found engaged in 200 different types of activities, of which 49 were regarded as being harmful to children's physical and mental health. Bangladeshi children that are often kidnapped are sold to work as camel jockeys in the Arab countries. Further to this, the government of Bangladesh performed a survey of 1,821 factories and found out that half of them are employed as children. In urban areas, around 43% of child workers are day labourers in a wide range of occupations including construction, manufacturing, factory, hotel or restaurant and domestic work. Excellency High Commissioner, you are going to Bangladesh. I'll be most grateful if you could do something towards helping the children of Bangladesh. They deserve equal rights like we do. They have been brought up into this world not to suffer, but to experience life in many forms through education, work and play. The children of Bangladesh who are poverty stricken have no little education, but they need and deserve a better and brighter future. Thank you. Today I have been invited to talk about the role model. What is role model? This is a very big image to follow. If society respects you as a role model, you have to take care of it. You cannot play it, you have to live in it. Look at the David Beckham now. He was a role model of those thousands of young generation. Now probably he's going to lose it. So in a gathering like this, we can not just talk about it. No one is going to listen or follow us. But if we live by an example, we would not have to tell our children to follow us. They automatically follow us. And they have respect for us. Our children's role model is their parents. Whether we agree or not, our children do follow us. What is good in them is a part of us. What is bad in them, also part of us. We always say our young generation don't have a role model. Is it true? Yes, it is. In a gathering like this, we say all the nice things, but in the real day-to-day -day life, we do it completely opposite. They do not have faith in us. We only think about ourselves and our so-called shomaj. I love Mrs. Thatcher for saying there is nothing called society. It is individual family doing individual thing. Society is there to help people in the first place. But when people start doing things for the society, then we would have to look at it. There's something very, very wrong somewhere along the line. We do not think about our children's difficulties. We constantly compare them with our upbringing. We do not have all those distractions they have now. Those of us who grow us in Bangladesh, our only distraction we had was the radio. And TV came to our life in 1965. But they had all those 260 TV channels, video, DVD, cinema, club, and more than 300 nationalities made. They are doing all different things. How on earth we accept them to cope without our support? We have to try hard to provide a framework for them which they can lean on, but we do not have the time for this or have no idea how to do this. So they look for the next best thing who drives a brand new BMW, Z4, a Mercedes. They want to be like them and they want it quickly. So they get into trouble for the first time when they are in trouble, we try to hide it, deny it, blame it, everybody. We even blame God. We compare ourselves with them and forget what is important to us has no value to them. We have no intention to help them, to equip them to survive in this country. We still dream to change the political party in Bangladesh. We do not have time for parents' evening in this school, but we have time to go to airport to welcome our corrupt politician. And, 
And this is the problem we have in our society. We are still fulfilling our dream. Our children are not doing what they're supposed to do. And we are blaming everybody, everything, and except ourselves. It is the parents who needs to lay down the foundation of the child's life. I really am uh, delighted to be asked to be here this evening and to be able to outline to you all and indeed uh, to the High Commissioner how it is Birmingham City Council has worked and indeed continues to work uh, for the Bangladeshi community here in Birmingham and indeed with Bangladesh itself. In Birmingham, we pride ourselves on having a clear vision for our city, for making things happen that have a real impact on our neighborhoods, for working in partnership with our local communities, but also for encouraging change which is sustainable and which contributes to the long-term social and economic well-being of our city. One of Birmingham's greatest strengths is its rich diversity of the multicultural communities that make up this city, and indeed of the pivotal roles that these communities are playing in driving forward this city of Birmingham. According to the 2001 census, ethnic communities make up some 29.6% of the Birmingham population. It is essential, therefore, that we, re that we all recognize that Birmingham's uh, future fortunes are inseparable from the successes of the ethnic minority populations of this city. But in common with the rest of the UK, the most disadvantaged community in Birmingham is the Bangladeshi community, who according to those same census figures make up 2.13% of the Birmingham population. But the Bangladeshi community is also a young community. Those same census figures indicate that 3.7% of all 0 to 15 year olds are within the Bangladeshi community. So we are a city of young Bangladeshis. And although the city council has worked for some while to improve the lives of Bangladeshi community here in Birmingham. In 2002, this uh, activity took a major step forward when the City Council and other public sector agencies were asked by the Bangladeshi community to do more to reduce the multiple disadvantages experienced by the community. In October 2002, I was delighted to participate in the Bangladeshi Community Conference, attended by over 130 delegates from those public agencies, the voluntary sector, and the Bangladeshi community itself. As a result of the recommendations agreed at the conference, a Bangladeshi task force was established with representation from the Bangladeshi community and the public sector service providers. The remit given to that task force was to seek to improve the lives of the Bangladeshi community here in Birmingham through better provision of public services and measurable growth in the economic prosperity of the community. I believe the task force has made significant progress since it was established. Action plans have been produced highlighting the relative position of the Bangladeshi community population compared to the white population in respect to specific services. This process has identified the adverse, dis the adverse disadvantage gaps that exist between the Bangladeshi and white communities here in this city. For example, 21.3% of people classified as unemployed are from the Bangladeshi community, compared to 4.7% from the white community. The process has also compared other matters 
It has identified that the Bangladeshi community are advantaged in terms of health, disadvantaged rather in terms of health, disadvantaged in terms of social care. With just 3.85% of the elderly people aged 65 or over receiving support from social services, compared to uh, a white population where the figure is very much different. As a direct result of the task force, service providers have now set specific targets to reduce these gaps in order to improve employment opportunities business opportunities, education and skills, housing, health and social care for the Bangladeshi community here in this city. I'm pleased that since that task force was established, a number of successes have achieved, have been achieved. For example, in terms of employment, the Bangladeshi community did take advantage of the jobs that were coming through on the opening of the bull ring. And that was a direct result of joint partnership working between Job Centre Plus, the City Council, and community organisations. We did this by proactively marketing job, opportun op job opportunities to target the Bangladeshi community. In addition, job fairs to encourage employment within the Council itself have been held at many Bangladeshi community organisations. And this year, our employment subgroup of the task force has made a commitment to increase by 5% the num number of Bangladeshi community people accessing job opportunities through such as the employment zone, action teams, and the economic development funded Bangladeshi projects. One of the aims of the task force was to improve qualifications and skills of the Bangladeshi community here in this city. A vital objective if we're to reduce unemployment uh, within the Bangladeshi community. Connections who are represented on the task force have commissioned contracts to the value of £90,000 through three local community providers for a range of regional activity to engage young people from the local community in learning. They've also had two targeted opening, open evenings for Bangladeshi parents and have established a second office in the Aston area in order to encourage the Bangladeshi community in their uh, educational achievements. I have to say, it is working. If I look at the statistics available to me here in this council, or through the council, I see, for example, that Bangladeshi girls, yes, Bangladeshi girls, but not Bangladeshi boys, are in the upper quartile of those youngsters in this city now receiving uh, uh, GCES, GCSE results at uh, A star grade uh, or, or A to four, A to C grades. That is a significant achievement. But if I look down through the statistics and look at, uh, for example, key stage two, what I see there is that the uh, Bangladeshi community is achieving sometimes better than other parts of the community here in Birmingham. If I look at level four, and above results at key stage two, then I find the difference between 1998 and 2003 is plus 8% for Bangladeshi boys, plus 12% for Bangladeshi girls in English. But in mathematics, it's even better. Plus 12% for Bangladeshi boys, plus 26% for Bangladeshi girls. I think it is beginning to work and that educational achievement levels amongst the Bangladeshi community are improving and will need to continue to improve if that community is to, those young people are to access jobs in the city in due course. These of course are just some examples of the successes to date, but much still needs to be done. I'm delighted that um, in the recent budget uh, that I took through the city council, we've now allocated a further 100,000 uh, pounds to form a small working group to take this work further forward in order to try and achieve in the next year or two even more. This will, I hope, enable public sector agencies to have access to a team of experiences, skills, and knowledge to help them access and improve their service deliver delivery to the Bangladeshi community. 
It will also provide a platform, I believe, for proper consultation between the City Council and those public sector agencies and the community. And it will be the strategic link between the public, public sector uh, agencies and the Bangladeshi community itself. But High Commissioner, there is one other matter I wish to comment on. Every year, the Lord Mayor visits one of the countries where many Birmingham citizens have their origins. Next year, in 2005-06, the Lord Mayor will be visiting Bangladesh. We're also working with the local uh, university, with the University of Central England, so that their teacher training students can have experience of education in Bangladesh, an experience we hope will help them when they go on to teach here in Birmingham schools. And we'll be looking for other ways, other practical cooperation ways uh, of, of enhancing the cooperation between major cities in Bangladesh and Birmingham itself. And I set that program out, High Commissioner, because I hope uh, in your office you will be able to assist us uh, with those objectives. So with the determined effort, commitment, and proper accountability from all the public sector providers here in this city, uh, we hope that we will continue uh, to address the deprivation and poverty amongst the Bangladeshi community here in this city. There are many opportunities which can be grasped, and I'm determined that this city council will continue to work closely with the Bangladeshi community in Birmingham to accelerate the prosperity and the standing of the Bangladeshi community here in Birmingham. Thank you very much. was really so eloquent and so sincere and so fine. I think we can all be really proud of her as a representative of her coming generation in this city. Bangladesh is, as you all know, a very serious um, development challenge. It's the largest of the category of the poorest countries in the world, the least developed countries. That includes a lot of the countries in Africa, Tanzania, Mozambique, um, Burundi, Rwanda, and so on. Mostly countries with, it's a slightly complicated formula of how they're selected, um, but mostly about $300 a head gross domestic product, which is $300 a head for every single thing that's spent in a country. For those of us who live here, it's something like $26,000 a head we have for every man, woman, and child in this country. Think of running a country and trying to provide with ev for everyone with that kind of low level of income. Bangladesh, 130 million people of the one billion in the world, the one in five of us that are still living in the extremes of poverty despite the kind of material wealth and well-being that we have in countries like this. What a, what a disordered world we live in uh, when there's that sort of level of inequality and poverty and we can't share the technology and the investment and the knowledge and get more rapid development for the poorest countries. We must come back to that priority very soon when we try and end some of the madness we have in the world right now. There's been considerable progress in Bangladesh, both in terms of economic growth and in terms of the proportion of girls who are going to school, and for any country the most profound the of the poor countries, the most profound change that you can get very quickly is if you can get a generation of children to school, including the girls. Even if it's just primary education, they bring a transformation as they grow up. A generation that's literate, um, then it grows up, tends to marry a bit later, have less children who are more likely to survive, is better at increasing the household income, of getting their own children to school, and so on. And there's been improvement in that. It's, there's more to be done, but there's been improvement in Bangladesh on girls' education. And population growth has been slowing. As, fam as, as girls are educated, as families see their, ch their children survive, they have less children, and that gives them a chance to improve the life opportunities of their children. And that is happening in, ba in Bangladesh, but it's still an enormously young population. And therefore, even with the slower population growth, the projections are in Bangladesh over the next 30 years that the population will increase by 50%. You know how crowded it is on that river delta. And we've also got global warming, and sea levels are going to rise 
and Bangladesh is, for large parts of it, a very large river delta, so it's very vulnerable to the effects of global warming and rising sea levels. And as you know, the Kyoto Protocol that was meant to start us getting the world under control on um, emissions of carbon dioxide to stop the continuing rise um, in sea levels has been put to one side. Bangladesh stands to lose a third of its territory. 50% increase, so it's very poor already, as you know, and as Atiyah so eloquently described. And it stands to have a 50% increase in its population and lose a third of its territory in a 30-year time scale. This is enormously serious. I mean, there are other countries in, amongst the poorest countries who face similar hurdles, but this is an enormous challenge. Business as usual won't do. There's got to be much more rapid development um, in the, so that there's higher income levels and people can earn a living in different ways and move about and, and develop the country and contain some of the rise in sea levels and loss of land and so on. And this is very, very urgent indeed. And this means that we need to think about development much more seriously and differently than a lot of people have thought about it in the past. It's good, of course, to collect some money and to set up some charitable projects. And all people who care about other people should do that and do do that, but more than that is required. Bangladesh's own systems have got to be fixed. Government systems have got to work better. The problem of corruption, which was mentioned by our speaker talking about role models, is holding back the development of Bangladesh most seriously. When I first went to Bangladesh, I, I met with a, the World Bank, the IMF representative, the Asian Development Bank, and some of the other big players in the country. They said there's, tw there's about 20,000 people from the elite of Bangladesh <coughs> occupying positions in politics, business, the civil service, and so on, and they're holding back the prospects of 130 million people. And that's the truth of it. That's the tr in entrenched corruption and misuse of government powers. And you know the dreadful political system where the two parties just engage in hard towels and violence and attacking each other instead of getting on with improve, improving the governance of the country. So that the real issue for development is challenging corruption, setting in place decent, proper management systems for the public finances, competent health ministry, competent education ministry, training the teachers, maintaining the schools, producing the books, you know, having a decent tax system where the people who can afford it pay their taxes and the money is properly spent and the private sector can do its job in a clean and efficient way and help the economy to grow. And there's lots and lots of fantastically hardworking and enterprising people in Bangladesh who, if those sort of structures were put in place, would contribute enormously to the advance of the country. And that's the real issue for development, helping and supporting reform elements in Bangladesh um, to reform an, the country and improve its own systems. Now, the High Commissioner for his sins, probably happily, doesn't have responsibility for running Britain's development programme in Bangladesh, because if he did, it involves quite a lot of clashing. I mean, you don't want to fall out all the time, but the development job is to get the systems fixed and help work with the reformers in the country. And clearly there are vested interests who like the old order and are doing well out of it, so it's not always the kind of easiest and most um, gentle of relationships. And so I'm, I'm pleased to say the High Commissioner doesn't have to um, lead the day-to-day -day development program. There's a large Department for International Development office. It's got a program of 18, 90 million pounds spending a year. It could be bigger. It's, it's difficult to spend money well in Bangladesh because of all these problems. There'd be a lot more development money would come into the country if there was a bigger commitment to reform and then that money would come and help drive forward those reforms much more quickly. All the big development agencies say it's difficult to spend money well in Bangladesh. But of course the High Commissioner will work very closely with the DFID office in trying to support those efforts. Um, but the DFID will continue to try and do what it can to help reformers in Bangladesh improve um, the, the, the situation in that country. And that's another thing to say to our Bangladeshi community in Britain. Silhet is not the poorest part of Bangladesh. Now, quite naturally, the Bangladeshi community in Britain says, come on, spend the British development money in Silhet. But I think we're getting more mature than that, aren't we now? Of course, you want things to be good in, in Silhet, but I think I've seen lots of your heads nodding. 
you understand fully well that focusing on the poorest and fixing the systems is about advancing the, the whole country. So it won't always be that all the projects and all the money will be spent in Silhet. It will be spent where it best can be spent in trying to advance the prospects for the whole country. And I think myself that the, the community in Britain needs to think more deeply about how it can help drive the reform effort, be friends of the reformers, help those who want to challenge the corruption, uh, use the strength of the educated young generation we have here, trading links and all the rest, to find ways that go beyond, yes, of course, nice projects in Silhet, but helping the reformers in Bangladesh really move the country forward. And I think that's a conversation that we need to have more deeply, but I think the younger generation growing up here are more and more determined to try and make a contribution in that kind of way. I join you to congratulate Mr. Anwar Choudhury, Excellency, please accept our heartiest congratulations on, you, on your well-deserved assignment as the British High Commissioner in Bangladesh. As we understand, you are the first Asian having the privilege to be appointed in such a high-profile assignment. <laughs> and the British Bangladesh community is proud of you. In fact, you have created history. And I'm confident that you will prove that the British government has taken the right decision. They have chosen the right person for the right job. Bangladesh and the UK are enjoying excellent bilateral relations. We sincerely hope that with your patronization, the volume of bilateral trade between Bangladesh and Britain will increase. We hope that during your tenure, the bilateral relation between Bangladesh and the UK would be further cemented. Hope this will be the beginning of the beginning of a new era in the bilateral relations between Bangladesh and the UK. I'm grateful to you, Excellency, for highlighting the potential of Bangladesh during your deliberations with the children. I'd like to make few comments on the deliberations of Sir Albert Bo. He has mentioned about the Bangladeshi task force. For obvious reason, he didn't mention his role in the task force which I am obliged to do. In fact, this task force was created in the conference he referred, held in October 2002, under his initiative. And he has taken the job so seriously, the task force is working under his direct supervision and guidance. And I'd like to place on record my gratitude on behalf of my community for your continued support for my community. And I'm highly appreciative of our community leaders, the role of our community leaders in maintaining racial harmony and community cohesion, which is very important in a multiracial society here in the UK. Deputy Lord Mayor, Council Leader Sir Albert Bohr, Right Honourable Claire Short MP, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. If I may begin by thanking you for arranging this event and inviting me to such a gathering of leading British Bangladeshis in Birmingham. This is a great city that is going through a rejuvenation that I think we can all be proud of. I see a Birmingham that looks very different to me than the one I saw 10 or 15 years ago. Thank you also for the very kind and generous comments from all the speakers. I feel humble 
and honored to stand before you today as the next British High Commissioner to Bangladesh. I also feel deeply proud to be a member of your community. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you already know how I feel about Bangladesh, that I have the deepest affection for Bangladesh and its people. And the honor to be able to serve and represent my country, the United Kingdom, in the country of my birth and that of my ancestors is nothing less than the realization of a rather an unlikely and an ultimate dream. But what attracts me to Bangladesh is the potential. It's the potential I see in the country, the potential I see in its people, and the potential I see in enhancing our bilateral relationship. It is said that the job of an ambassador is to represent the interests of his country. But I think it is also to represent the values and the identity of his country. And I would like to say a little bit about both. So let me begin with our interests. First and foremost, that our interests are entirely at congruence with that of Bangladesh. The UK is a friend of Bangladesh. We want Bangladesh to be a successful country. And it is this overall objective that defines the essence of our bilateral relationship. A stronger bilateral relationship will mean working hard and even closer together. It means acknowledging the successes and it means acknowledging the challenges that still remain. So let me begin with some successes. First, the economy. We are happy that the Bangladesh economy is doing well. It is growing at 5% with low inflation and strengthening reserves. This is a significant achievement which we applaud. A few weeks ago, I met Mr. Saifur Rahman, the Bangladesh finance minister, and we congratulated him on the country's continued economic performance. But we also know that the economy has the potential to grow faster. Indeed, it must if Bangladesh is to narrow the gap. We believe that the growth of 8 or 9 percent is not only necessary, but is not beyond Bangladesh. It is not far-fetched to think, for us at least, that the, land, <coughs> that the land of the Bengal tiger can one day also be the land of the tiger economy. There are many other achievements that has happened since the independence of Bangladesh. I shall not go into all of them, but very briefly, it is noteworthy to know that Bangladesh has now reduced its absolute poverty level by almost 15% to 34%, that there are equal numbers of boys and girls enrolled in primary education, and the country is now self-sufficient in food. But Bangladesh still faces many challenges with which you are all familiar. The worsening, the worsening governance situation, the lack of national and political consensus, the worsening law and order situation are all continual worries that hold back foreign investment and hinders Bangladesh from achieving its potential. That potential should be clear. It is clear to the British government, it is clear to me. There is no reason why Bangladesh cannot be a Malaysia within 10 to 20 years' time. I know its people are as every bit as capable. Ladies and gentlemen, it is in our interest to see a prosperous, stable, and strongly democratic Bangladesh. And we stand ready, as always, and as a friend to assist in any way we can. The development of Bangladesh is a shared objective of our governments. The UK's development program in Bangladesh is well known. It is one of the largest in the world. The UK currently gives around 100 million pounds in aid each year, and we want to give more. 
Recently, we have announced another 100 million contribution for primary education. This will help to get 3 million children into school. We have also approved another 50 million for helping people who live in the most vulnerable areas of Bangladesh. These are people who live on river islands and river banks who face devastation each year as the floods come and go. Let me now turn to an area of our bilateral relationship which perhaps interests you most, that of immigration and visas. It is an area that is close to me too. I still remember vividly going to the British High Commission in Dhaka with my mother and my younger brother in 1970. I was filled with emotion and all the excitement and hope of a small child wanting to join his father in a country that I heard so much about and where I knew so much was possible. Things have, of course, moved on since then. But I recognize, we recognize, that we are still dealing with the same hopes and anguish of so many people as we did then. That for many, it's a life-changing decision, and we must get it right. In 2003, we had a record 38,000 applications for visas. We have also issued nearly 4,000 settlement visas for spouses and relatives. We want to do more so that our people receive a good service of which we can be proud. But we do face challenges. There are a fair amount of what I call challenging applications, some of it rather imaginative. But the demand for visas continue to increase, and it has doubled in more than three, <coughs> it has more than doubled in three years. But we remain determined to meet these challenges through further modernization of our service. Recently, you'll be aware that we have opened a visa office in Silet and a visa office in, in Dhaka. But irrespective of the visa situation, it will be my personal aim to continue to ensure that irrespective of the outcome of the application, which will of course be decided and must be decided on the merits of the case, that all applicants are treated as customers and with dignity and with respect. Our visa services are a shop window through which people <coughs> form impressions and attitude towards modern Britain. It is an opportunity to display the best of British culture. It is an opportunity for us to show the qualities for which we are respected and admired throughout the world. Immigration has played a huge role in shaping today's Britain. It is a different Britain that we see today. I believe Britain has a new identity. It is a multicultural and multi-faith nation. The infusion of our culture, of our cuisine, and our color has had a huge part in the creation of today's Britain. It is a Britain that is the fourth richest country in the world. It is a Britain that values and celebrates diversity that different communities bring. It is a Britain that is confident to demand the duties of citizenship and belonging. It is a Britain where despite the tensions, it remains tolerant and at ease. And today's modern, multicultural, multi-faith Britain, although not perfect, is rightly the envy of many across the world. We should take pride in modern Britain, for we have helped to create it. You have helped to create it. It deserves your support and engagement because this is your country. And I see no reason for conflict or confusion on our identity in the community today. We are British, but we also have Bengali heritage, of which we are proud. This makes us British Bengalis, proud of their heritage, proud 
to be British and to play a full part in the success of Britain. This is no different to the Italian, German, or Irish communities in the USA who see themselves as 100% American, but proud to be of Irish, German, or Italian heritage. And it is also worthwhile remembering, and I never tire of saying this, that a multi-sourced British identity is not really new to Britain either. For our Queen has German heritage, her husband has Greek heritage, and we have Bengali or Asian heritage, but we are as every bit as British as anybody else in this country. I hope you can see why I feel privileged to represent modern Britain. I hope when, <clears throat> when we look back, we see this period as a turning point for how Britain is perceived and how our community is perceived. For I want to work with you in turning around the image of our community so that it accurately reflects its many talents and successes and not just the challenges that still remain. I want to work with you to create a new mood we want to create a community where our confidence in ourselves and in Britain will mean that we look at new horizons, that we and our children do not just aim at joining the professions, but aspire, aspire to become the country's leaders in all walks of life. Ladies and gentlemen, it must be right, indeed a duty, that we aim to join the establishment that helps to run, defend, and represent our country. The civil service, the defense service, the foreign service needs and wants talent. Our community has plenty in supply. Still, some people worry about discrimination, worry about glass ceilings for minorities. I say don't. And I say this with the experience and the rare privilege of having worked in British industry, in the Royal Air Force, in the Ministry of Defense, in the Cabinet Office, and now the Foreign Office. And I say the glass ceiling is a distraction. It is only fear, misinformation, and the lack of confidence that stops us aiming higher. Ladies and gentlemen, it is clear to me that there needs to be, and indeed there is a new mood, in <coughs> a new mood emerging in the British Bangladeshi community. A community that is increasingly confident. Confident of its capability and of its contribution. A community that questions, questions the need to accept deprivation and recognizes that there is wealth and opportunity at its doorstep. It would be a real shame if our community, and our young in particular, cannot see what could and should be theirs. The worst form of deprivation of all is the deprivation of ambition. And I think our community has been suffering from that for too long. But creating this new mood or environment is not going to be easy. It cannot be done without the will and the engagement of people like yourself. And it will take time. But if you falter, remember just how far we have already come. Today, I do not know many families whose kids are not at university and are not looking at professional careers. Today, we already produce the country's youngest mayors, its leading businessmen, its top doctors, its bankers, its top lawyers, its engineers, and the list could go on. And then there is a real rich stream of people coming on, on board. If you have any doubt, and if you listen to this young girl of 11 years today, if you listen to her eloquence, her vision, you know the sort of talent that we have in this community. And you know what the future of this community is going to be like. This is a great platform for our future. And as I look at my own present and future, 
Let me firstly say how deeply I have been touched by the generosity and the warmth you have shown me. I am often moved by the letters I receive from this community and the people of Bangladesh. I know I'll face some unique challenges, but I also know I enjoy some unique advantages. And your good will and your good wishes will always be a cherished bonus for me. I hope I can live up to your expectations and that our High Commission and I can be of some service to you. So let me end. Let me end by wishing you, the British Bangladeshi community of Birmingham, the very best of futures. Let me ask you to play a full part in the success of Britain. Let me ask you to stand proud of your community. Let me ask you to stand proud of your achievements and the achievements of your children. And finally, let me say to you that I, as a British Bangladeshi, will always stand proud of you all. Thank you very much. It is only possible for me to do this event. I received the support from the leader of his, Sir Albert Bo, their financial support. Birmingham City a reception committee and my close friend, the director of the Blue Water, he's here this evening. My thanks goes to you. Without your financial support, it will be impossible for me to put this event together. First of all, I'd like to thank His Excellency Mr. Anwar Chaudhary to take his time to come and see us in Birmingham. To work in Bangladesh as a foreign NGO, you've got to have Prime Minister of his permission to have an office there. We are nearly there, halfway down. We're going to start our project in end of this financial year. I'll be asking His Excellency Mr. Anwar Chaudhary during his office time in Bangladesh to visit Sunam Gonj and up in our center. And project we are going to start is called the Learning and Earning for the Young People in the poorest part of Bangladesh in Silet Division, which is about 40 or 50 miles away from Silet.